There's a dark side to the plant kingdom. A savage place of ravenous appetites. Lethal spiky traps and deep pits filled with the decomposing bodies of unfortunate victims. A carnivorous plant is a, a plant that eats meat. It attracts, captures and digests prey. Why do carnivorous plants need to capture prey? They need it to subsidise their nutrients. They live in uh, nutrient-poor environments, acid soils, so capturing prey provides the nutrients that they need to grow and flourish. Greg Burke is the curator-manager of the Blue Mountains Botanic Garden. But at home, he keeps busy with his own collection of these amazing and hungry plants. There's close to 800 species worldwide, and at the moment, we're discovering new species nearly every month. In Australia, though, there's 300 species, so uh, a lot of diversity in Australia alone, uh, centred around southwestern Australia and as well in the top end. Now, what is it about a pitcher? Can you give me a definition? What do they do? OK, a pitcher is a modified leaf. All of these plants have different shaped pitchers with a lid or a nectar spoon or somewhere where it can feed the prey and then a belly, if you like, that can consume the prey. And what about this one? It's hanging off a long stem there. Yeah, this is the actual leaf of the plant. The plant's called H.R. Geiger. It was only recently described and it's a cultivar. And people would think that this is the leaf, but it's actually the petiole or the stem of the leaf. And this is the true leaf, so a highly modified part of the plant. So they've evolved over years to, to, to lure this prey. What are some of the mechanisms that they use? Many will produce this coloration that's um, similar to rotting meat. So they're carrion feeders, so they're attracting bugs. And then others will mimic flowers, so they're attracting bees and wasps and, and butterflies. Inside it's got digestive fluids similar to our stomach acids. One of these plants can digest a mouse in about six weeks. <laughs> a whole mouse? Yeah. Wow. Uh, all that's left is a little bit of fur and maybe some bones. Oh, I suppose now we should look at these beautiful pitcher plants. Whoa. So we've just been looking at those pitchers in the shade house. Now these ones are exposed out here. How, how are they going to survive? These ones are from North America, an area that gets uh, covered in snow for many months of the year. And up here in the Blue Mountains with our cool winters, these plants thrive. They'll actually go dormant in winter, so the pitchers will die down. And then in the springtime, the flowers come up and then followed by these beautiful pitchers that grow throughout the summer. And here's something a lot more traditional. I mean, this is what gets people's attention, doesn't it? Absolutely. The Venus flytrap, described by Charles Darwin as the most wonderful plant in the world, has these beautiful, moving, bed-like traps. And what child can resist uh, playing with a Venus flytrap? These are sun juice, Costa. They're uh, sticky plants. They produce a sweet nectar like other carnivorous plants, but they trap their prey directly on the leaves with sticky glue-like mucilage. And this one here, it looks like there's just raindrops scattered all over each and every one of the, the stems. This is called the Cape Sundew from South Africa and one of the most popular of all the sundews. It's easily grown. It produces a good amount of seed, so anyone can grow it at home. And it also has really good leaf movement. You can see here one leaf that's folded in half over yeah. an insect. And, and why they do that is to get as many glands in contact with the prey as possible, and then they can digest the prey quicker and reopen to capture more prey. It's not hard to see why Greg loves his carnivores. They're so different to anything you're likely to grow in your garden. And really, who doesn't like a plant that catches its own dinner? Do you see an end to this obsession? Uh, no, look, the, the plant collection will continue to grow. One of the great things about growing these unusual species is that you can then work on hybridising them to produce cultivars and things that are easier for the general public to grow in their own backyards. 
Well, that's it for this week. I've managed to survive my time here in the land of carnivorous plants. So let's have a look at what's coming up on next week's show.